Gopi Janabalaba Yevarhari Yasoda Nandana Rajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Yamuna Panachahari Kheeradha Madhva Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Amarva Kunja Vihadi Jaya Vishnu Pada Paramahamsa Parajacharya Ashtata Sarishta AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Sri Sri Nittai Goranga Rai Ki Jai, Sri Jagannath Baladev Sabadu Ki, Sri Sri Radha Krishna Kanaya Ki, Grantaraj Shrima Bhagavatam Ki, Govara Premanandi, all glorious to be assembled devotees, all glorious to Sri Guranga Ranga, go to Sri Prabhupada, Om Vishnu Badaya, Krishna Prastaya Bhutale Sri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinaya, Namaste Sarasati Divan, Gora Vani Vicharine, Nervasasya Sinyavari Asta Chari Shatari Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, Chapter 21, Text 32. Viniduta Ashesha Manamalaha Pubad Asanga Vigyana Vishesha Viryavan Yat, Angri, Mule, Kritiketanaha, Punaha, Na, Sansvitim, Kleshavaham, Papadyate. Vene dute shesha mano malapuman. Asanga vigyana vishesha viryayavan. Yadangvi mule krita ketana punar. Nasang sviting klesha vaham papadyate. Venedita Shesha Mano Malak Puman Asanga Vigyana Vishesha Viryavan 
Yadhangri mule kita hate nak punar. The songs for Ting Klesh of a hum for Pudgete. Venir to Tashesha Mano Malak Puman. A song of Vigyan of a Shesha Viryavan. Yadang Vimolek at the Kate and Punar. The song fitting clash of a hum papajate. Ladies, a song of Vigyana Vishesha Viryavan, Yarangvi Mulekita Ketana Puna. The song fitting place of a hum for Pajate. Venir de Tashesha Mano Malak Puman. A song of Vigyana Vishesha Viryavan. Yadang Vimole Kita Ketanak Punar. The song fitting place of a hum for Pajate, Vinir Dutta, being specifically cleansed, Ashesha, unlimited, Manak Malaha, mental speculation or the dirt accumulated in the mind. Puman, the person, a sangha, being disgusted, vijnana, scientifically, vishesha, particularly, viryavan, being strengthened in bhakti yoga, yat, whose, angri, lotus feet, mule. At the root of. Kita Ketanaha. Taken shelter. Puna. Again. No. Never. No. No. Songs for Tim. Material existence. Kleshavaham, full of miserable conditions. Papajate takes two. 
Translation Purple by Sri Krapa. When a devotee takes shelter at the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he's completely cleansed of all misunderstanding or mental speculation. And he manifests renunciation. This is possible only when one is strengthened by practicing bhakti yoga. Once having taken shelter at the root of the lotus feet of the Lord, a devotee never comes back to this material existence, which is full of the threefold miseries. Oh, sorry, but would it be possible to get my computer? Get the key. Key. Purport by Sri Prabhupada, as stated by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in his six Shastakam instructions, by the chanting of the holy name of the Lord, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, or by the process of hearing and chanting of the glories of the Lord, one's mind is gradually cleansed of all dirt. Due to our material association since time immemorial, we have accumulated heaps of dirty things in our minds. The total effect of this takes place when a living entity identifies himself with his body. Now, Prabhupada says here, the total effect. And this, as we've mentioned many times, as Prabhupada mentions, this is the greatest sin in the sense although it doesn't appear to be a sin in the way we use the word, but it's the cause of all other sins is their identification with the body. So it's considered the greatest sin because everything else come, comes from that, basically. The total effect and uh, the entrapped is thus entrapped by the stringent laws of material nature and put into the repeated cycle of birth and death under the false impression of bodily identification. When one is strengthened by practicing bhakti yoga, his mind is cleansed of this misunderstanding and he is no longer interested in material existence or in sense gratification. Bhakti or devotional service is characterized by varagya and jnana. Jnana refers to understanding that one is not the body, and varagya means disinterest in sense gratification. So these would be that the testa uh, of the um, secondary external reasons, the testa lakshana, uh, or the external definition of bhakti is kind of characterized by the presence of actual jnana or realization of our spiritual identity and of renunciation from the bodily platform of life. These two primary principles of separation from material bondage can be realized on the strength of bhakti yoga. They can come to a secondary effects of bhakti yoga. It's not, I mean, it's not, or it depends how we define it, but it's not the absolute goal of bhakti yoga it is the goal of bhakti yoga to realize their constitution but just to realize we're not this body is not absolutely it's not absolute it's uh, not, not complete or to have knowledge um, and have detachment from this world the goal is not just to be detached from this world but these are natural effects characteristics of bhakti yoga that one becomes aware and realize one's identity apart from this body and one will become disinterested in material sense gratification. These two primary principles of separation from material bondage can be realized on the strength of Bhakti Yoga. Thus when a devotee is fixed in the loving service of the lotus feet of the Lord, he will never come back to this material existence. After quitting his body, as confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita by the Lord Himself, Chakvade Hampunajama Naji Mamiti Sojuna, if we understand the transcendental nature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, um, one never has to take birth again in this world. 
but attains to the spiritual realm. In this verse, the word vijnana is specifically important. Jnana, the knowledge of spiritual identity that one attains when he does not consider himself to be the body, is explained in Bhagavad Gita as Brahmabhuta, the revival of spiritual realization. In the conditioned state of material existence, one cannot be spiritually realized because he identifies himself materially. The understanding of the distinction between material existence and spiritual existence is called jnana. After coming to the platform of jnana, or the Brahma Buddha stage, one ultimately comes to devotional service, in which he completely understands his own position and the position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This understanding is explained here as Vijnana Vivshesh. The Lord says, therefore, that knowledge of him is Vijnana, science. In other words, when one is strengthened by scientific knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the position of liberation is guaranteed. In Bhagavad Gita, the science of devotional service is described as putyaksa bhagamam dharmyam, direct understanding of the principles of religion by realization. By practicing bhakti yoga, one can directly perceive this advancement in spiritual life. In other practices like karma yoga, jnana yoga and dhyana yoga, one may not be confident about his progress, but in bhakti yoga one can become directly aware of his progress in spiritual life, just as a person who eats can understand that his hunger is satisfied. Our false appetite for enjoyment and lordship of the material world is due to a prominence of passion and ignorance. By bhakti yoga, these two qualities are diminished and one becomes situated in the mode of goodness. Gradually surpassing the mode of goodness, one is situated in pure goodness, which is not contaminated by the material qualities. When thus situated, the body no longer has any doubts. He knows that he will come, he will not come back to this material world. So it's very, you can say, to the point, verse and purport, covering the essential ingredients of the devotee's um, spiritual advancement, at least up to the stage of liberation, not much mention of our constitutional position beyond liberation. Um, so, obviously, first of all, this ABC understanding has to be there and it has to be realized in order to come, Brahma Bhutta perfect quotes, Brahma Bhutta Prasnathana Sochiti Nakamshiti. Um, has anyone got the first canto of Bhagavatam here, please? Srimad Bhagavatam, canto one, part one. I don't know if it's here in English. Yeah. This whole process of gradual elevation to the spiritual platform is described, thank you. It's described in several places in Bhagavatam, in the second chapter of the Bhagavatam, it's probably the most profound and famous of those, um, let's say, verses. Prabhupada quotes them in many places. In his Markane Bhagavat Dharma, he quotes many of them in a series in a row. Um, and the effects of devotional service are described therein. Now, in this particular verse, Concentration on the lotus feet of the Lord is the main um, limb of devotional service being emphasized. We saw yesterday that that incorporates, it basically means taking on the instructions of the spiritual master as one's focus, as one's meditation. And that's considered to be meditating on the lotus feet of the Lord. Meditation on the lotus feet of the Lord in whatever form um, when say form, whatever way we understand that, if it's actually meditating upon the Lord's lotus feet, and um, it's described in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, um, I think by Kapila Muni, how that acts just like the thunderbolts of Indra smash to pieces great mountains. It's describing how Lord Shiva, the section is describing, becomes all the more auspicious by taking the water of the Ganges upon his head. 
which we discussed also. Um, and by taking that water on his head, he, she was what well, means auspicious, becomes even more auspicious by taking that water upon his head. Because that water has emanated from the lotus feet of the Lord. I think we actually read that in the last few days. It is emanating from the Lord's lotus feet. And uh, as a result, it is purifying. It is described just as the thunderbolts of Lord Indra smash to pieces great mountains. Meditating on the lotus feet of the Lord smashes to pieces all the desires and sinful reactions within the heart. And it's said that they're like a mountain. It smashes the mountain of sinful reactions and desires within our heart. Meditating on the lotus feet of the Lord um, destroys the uh, inclination. In other words, what becomes detached from the material bodily platform of life. When it completely um, destroys those uh, false concepts, as we heard just now, that this idea that I'm the body is, is the cause of the root of all other problems. The, the greatest sin, whatever uh, terminology may be there. So that is also smashed by meditation on the lotus feet of the Lord, or to speak of detachment from the objects of the senses. When it becomes detestable, one who has tasted the sweet nectar of the Lord's lotus feet, the very idea of sex life becomes detestable. When to speak of all other kinds of, of um, sense gratification, even sex life becomes detestable. But Yumanachara said he spits at the thought since he's been engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. Uh, the very idea is, is detestable. So uh, we're going to read now something um, from the Bhagavatam in the first canto. Then we'll see if we can find something to further embellish that. And I'm sure most of you have read this, the second chapter, Divinity and Divine Nature. We'll take this up. Oh. Oh, we well, we'll start with text. We could read the whole chapter, but we'll start with text 15 um, as a prelude to the verses mentioned indirectly by Prabhupada here. This is Sutta Goswami speaking to the sages of Naimasharanya. They've asked him many questions. These are some of the answers. With sword in hand. You have your sword? We have swords here. Give it to Tanya Prabhupada. You have to have a sword in hand. You have to get some swords. <laughs> Asina. Asina sword. Intelligent men cut through the binding knots of reaction you work karma by remembering the personality of Godhead. Therefore, who will not pay attention to his message? So what do we mean here with sword in hand? What is this sword in hand? Does it literally mean we carry a sword? <laughs> Not as easy as that. It's the weapon of knowledge. Huh? With knowledge. The word weapon is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. Weapon of knowledge. Even the word Shastra, Shastra, one means weapons, one means Shastra or scriptures. It's a very similar word. So it's described that. We, it cuts, it cuts as the previous word, Yoda Nidhasana Yukta, Karma Grunt and Abundant. And this Karma Grunt is not of karma, but bind up the living engine, Dunti. Over this, this, you know, this cut, the sharp sword of knowledge. This, this can be cut uh, by remembering the personality of God. It, as we heard yesterday or the day before, how this is the essence of all knowledge, to simply remember the personality of Godhead. So, um, we'll finish the purport. Um, oh, oh, no, we're reading from him. Uh, first, second canto, uh, first canto, second chapter, text number 16. 
O oh, twice born sages, by serving those devotees who are completely freed from all vice, great service is done. By such service one gains affinity for hearing the messages of Vasudev. You could have had it on the board, but probably too late now. By service, uh, rendering devotional service. Devotional service is not a mental concoction, it's not a, a mundane activity. Devotional service is appointed or is uh, delivered by the pure devotees of the Lord. Bhakti, devotion, is in the heart of the pure devotees. And because it's in the heart, bhakti therefore ignites bhakti in others who have yet to realize their devotion. So even without realization, if someone by the pure devotee's grace, um, one comes in contact, he may, uh, by his manifestation, by the manifestation of bhakti, it may ignite a spark in our own hearts, a spark of bhakti in our own hearts, which will gradually begin to burn in due course of time. And that devotional service, uh, when that engaged in service, this ignites or attracts attention to hearing about Krishna. Devotional service generally, you may hear and you may not hear about Krishna's pastimes or whatever, but if some or other ones engaged in devotional service, it will begin to purify the heart and the attraction to hear about Krishna should develop. It's a guide, it's a, like a yardstick, it's a measure um, of one's actual progress in spiritual life. Two, two sides. One, one side are we okay? One side is the uh, attraction to hearing about Krishna. The other side is the detachment from hearing other subject matters. What's happening? Pardon? What was that? Take who somewhere? You're going to Penang or you're staying for the class? Pardon? Pardon? What's going on? Harry Ball. So, serving those devotees, one gets the mercy of Krishna. By serving the Vaishnavas, one naturally pleases Krishna. And Krishna reciprocates by removing in the heart attachments to the material world and awakening in the heart attraction to hear about him. So it goes deeper. Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, who is the super soul in everyone's heart and the benefactor of the truthful devotees who is sincere, cleanses the desire for material enjoyment from the heart of the devotee who has developed the urge to hear his messages, which are in themselves virtuous when properly heard and chanted. So heard and chanted properly means to hear from the right source, not to hear from... Uh, bogus uh, professional reciters or impersonalists or materialists but to hear from those who are truly detached from this world never means they have no material affection they have no interest in this material world their only interest is in service to the Lord so when we hear from such persons uh, the effect is very purifying the message becomes very very purifying and of course, from the point of view of the devotee, one has to hear from atten with attention. By rendering service, it gradually, let's say, uh, pacifies or cleanses our, our minds so we can begin to start to hear, to hear a little more clearly. And that, when the Lord sees that we're hearing with attention, we're trying to hear those messages, um, then he, he even more goes deeper. One thing is to clear the surface so we can begin... But another thing is to remove the root. Krishna removes the root, right down to the root. Removes the very seed or desire 
for material enjoyment from the heart, a de much deeper form of cleansing, which is required if we're actually to go back to Godhead. It's not enough just to follow four regulated principles, etc. It has to go deeper than that. It has to remove the desire for those activities, the desire for all kinds of activities separate from Krishna. So then the next verse, which is very famous, by regular attendance in classes in the Srimad Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotees, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed and loving service unto the personality of God it, who is praised with transcendental songs is established as an irrevocable fact. And that's the point mentioned in the purple today. But we'll never come back again. Irrevocable means you can't reverse it. The attraction is one way. This is, uh, up, up to a certain point, it's not sure. But when one comes to this point, um, when the removal of the anatas in the heart, one comes nishta, the stage of nishta in the heart, um, when it's beyond anatas, beyond the attraction or the tendency for material sense gratification. One becomes very steady in one's devotion. And it goes still further. But then one gets a real taste in devotional service. And when one has a taste in devotional service, the taste for material life is, is not attractive at all. And then when, at that stage, one's a natural attraction because there's no deviation. There's no attraction for anything else. One's fixed in devotional practice. One's attraction for Krishna becomes, just like Queen Kunti says, it flows like the river Ganges down to the ocean. It becomes unwavering, undisturbed, unmotivated, fixed, unwavering, attraction towards Krishna. So that stage is no... Generally, of course, everything is... The risk is always there, the living entity is until one awakens one's prema, we understand that that possible risk is there. But generally speaking, that is never going to happen. Because when attraction towards Krishna is so strong, and one is totally uh, disinterested in the material world. And then Krishna, Sudha Goswami goes on, as soon as irrevocable devotional service, loving service, is established in the heart, the effects of nature's modes of passion and ignorance such as lust, desire and hankering, disappear from the heart. What Prabhupada mentioned in today's purport, the effect of devotional service, that these, the lust, and what we heard yesterday, these six enemies, lust, greed, anger, all these things, disappear from the heart. Because their effects, ultimately, of their envy of Krishna, but that's also removed by devotional service, they are then effects of the modes of passion and ignorance are destroyed. Um, and then the devotee is established in goodness and he becomes completely happy. In fixed goodness, not just mundane goodness, but the goodness of, of the knowledge, with knowledge, in other words, realizing one's spiritual identity and acting on that platform, which is the Sudashat, the platform, the platform of pure goodness. Next verse. Thus established in the mode of unalloyed, unalloyed goodness, um, the man whose mind has been enlivened by contact with devotional service to the Lord gains positive scientific knowledge of the personality of God as the next stage, not just realizing one's identity, not just being detached from this world, engaged in devotional service, fixed in devotional service, but then the Lord reveals himself. He one gains scientific knowledge, positive scientific knowledge of the personality of Godhead um, in the stage of liberation from all material association. So that stage, real devotional service, as Krishna says in Gita, Vama Bhutta Prasanatma, that an associate in the country, Samakta Vesha Bhutisha, Madhvaktim Labhate Pram, in that state of uh, when it's above the modes of nature, then real devotional service begins, otherwise it's mixed. As devotional service, but it's mixed with the modes of nature. So the practice itself is meant, the effect is that the gradually effects of passion and ignorance will dis be dissipated, and their concomitant um, effects in terms of lust or greed and anger and so on will all diminish and disappear altogether, practically to nil, the verse said. 
trace is there because of contact with material energy. But pure devotional service starts at that point when we realize our spiritual identity. Otherwise we're practicing, we have still a mixed devotional practices. But it's the process, everything starts from where we are at. Same with chanting Hare Krishna, we naturally, we don't start in the platform of Shudanam. We start at Aparad, um, in the form of Navabhas, where we're still attached to this material world, we're not very attentive, and we have all kinds of misconceptions, which are gradually purified when we hear the holy name of Shrima Bhagavatam from the right source. They cleanse our hearts of these misconceptions, these attractions to the material world by associating one who has no misconception, who has no attraction for this world. Their attraction is for Krishna. So if we serve under their protection, it means we're associating with them. And by associating with them, just that we become entangled in this world, by associating with the material energy, the objects of the senses, one becomes entangled. And one becomes, well, one's concepts are material. One's consciousness becomes completely covered. It's but by association, Prasanga Manjurum Parashamna, the living entity becomes entangled. Every learned man that knows the greatest um, entanglement to the living entity is their attachment to the material objects, or their association with the material objects of this world. When that same um, attachment is transferred to the self with our souls, it's the cause of our liberation. So to hear or associate, to serve under the direction of the liberated souls is a cause um, of our liberation, of our freedom from this world. And they, as we said here, as Sutta Goswami said, by regularly serving, hearing, serving, hearing the voice of the Lord, hearing Bhagavatam regularly is the methodology, is the medicine to hear from the pure devotees the subject matter of Krishna's pastime, name, form, pastimes, and, and uh, qualities. This is the methodology for purifying our heart of all unwanted desires, rooting them out, hearing carefully. Just like that verse which we just mentioned just now um, about meditating on the lotus feet of the Lord, Sutta Goswami said, therefore, one should meditate on the lotus feet and fixed on those lotus feet. Prabhupada says the yogi should be and meditate on the on the lotus feet of the Lord for a long period of time. For a devotee, by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, it may not be so long. But for the yogi, it takes a long time. If you didn't have the direct help, you could say, in a sense, that they're meditating on the lotus feet of the Lord, but they may not be engaged um, in the same way as one who's under the direction of a pure devotee of the Lord who gets extra mercy, for sure, especially if they're engaged in Lord Chaitanya's Sangatam movement, preaching Krishna consciousness movement. This is an ideal way for the, re the restless living entities in Kali Yuga of meditating on the lotus feet, meditating how to spread those lotus feet everywhere to give shelter to everyone in the form of the Sangatam movement. Just creating Bashada and the holy name books, etc. To give everyone shelter under the Lord's lotus feet. We'll finish the purport. No, we won't. We'll finish the next. I keep thinking we're on the purport stuff. Next verse. Thus the knot in the heart is pierced. This karma gunta is burned out, pierced, cut, chindanti, cut by the uh, weapon of knowledge, cut, burned out in the fire of devotion. The knot in the heart is pierced and all misgivings are cut to pieces. The chain of fruit of actions is terminated when one sees the self as master, when we understand our spiritual identity. That can cut the chain of reactionary work. And, of course, as we just heard in time, realize the identity of the personality of Godhead. So those are a series of verses which Prabhupada didn't refer to in, in the, today's verse. And, which Shri Prabhupada quotes many times, essential understand the process or the outline of the process given there and it's described in many places. Lord Kapila Dev describes it in his teachings. Narada Muni describes it when he's talking to Vyasa Dev. Lord Rishav Dev describes it when he's 
instructing his sons. It comes up many times. I'm going to search for some. I don't know if I'm going to find it. But we'll try. Regarding the lotus feet of the Lord. This can be taken completely literal. Meditating on the Lord's lotus feet can be taken literally. Or it can be taken, you know, in terms of its practical application. Literally means, you know, you literally look at the lotus feet and meditate on them, which is very nice. Purifying to our minds, our eyes, our minds, etc. Let's see if I've got it. I don't know if I've, I've still got it on my computer. Lotus feet. Srila Prabhupada's lotus feet, we always talk about his lotus feet also, lotus feet of the spiritual master. Lord's feet, lotus feet, I guess this is related to it. Lotus feet. <laughs> Let's see something. The demigod said, O Lord, your lotus feet are like an umbrella for the surrendered souls, protecting them from all the miseries of material existence. All the sages under that shelter throw off all material misery. We therefore offer a respectful obeisances unto your lotus feet. The Lord's transcendental bodily parts are always compared to the lotus flower because in the material world the lotus flower is the last word in beauty. So the Lord's lotus feet, they're also beautiful. The lotus flower is beautiful. Everything about Krishna is beautiful. And if we meditate that, we'll be on that beautiful form of the Lord. We can become free of the reflection of beauty in this world. The Paramahamsa makes his nest. This is a nice verse. Uh, the Paramahamsa makes his nest in the lotus-like face of the Lord and always seeks shelter at his lotus feet which are reached by the wings of Vedic wisdom. What nice metaphors used there. They're like birds. They make their nest in the lotus-like face of the Lord. It's their shelter. And always seek shelter at his lotus feet, which are reached by the wings of Vedic wisdom. With knowledge, we can reach those lotus feet, um, which are the only shelter from the pangs of material existence. Simply by hearing about your lotus feet with eagerness and devotion and by meditating upon them within the heart one at once becomes enlightened with knowledge and on the strength of detachment one becomes pacified. We must therefore take shelter of the sanctuary of your lotus feet. Everyone's looking for shelter, looking in the wrong place. We simply have to take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. The minds of materialistic persons are so disturbed it's almost impossible for them, them to search after the supreme truth by personal regulated endeavors. I don't know how that's going to but it is. Perhaps it's related. Oh, it's related to the next line. Taking shelter of the lotus feet means taking shelter of hearing, chanting, etc. The topics of Krishna Kata. Uh, without... Uh, it means we have to be a little eager, Robert writes, we have to be eager. And without such detachment, devotional service entails being initiated by a bona fide spiritual master and following his instructions in regard to hearing about the Lord. These are just, I have not looked at these just random quotes related. O oh Lord, persons who are entangled by undesirable eagerness for the temporary body and kinsmen, and who are bound by thoughts of mine and I, are unable to see your lotus feet. Although your lotus feet are situated within their own bodies, but let us take shelter of your lotus feet. And all these verses are from the third canto, chapter 5. But even a person perpetually condemned to the miseries of material existence can get relief from bondage if he simply agrees to hear only Krishna Kata. You hear that? Hmm. 
Oh, great supreme personality of God, a defensive person whose internal vision has been too affected by external materialistic activities cannot see your lotus feet. But those feet are seen by your pure devotees whose one and only aim is to transcendentally enjoy your activities. They relish the pastimes of the Lord. First they want to give pleasure to pleasure to Krishna. And constantly, naturally one relishes them Krishna's activities. Offenders have to wait until they receive the mercy of devotees. And then they can become eligible to see the lotus feet of the Lord within themselves. And then the verse we mentioned already. By constantly serving the lotus feet of great devotees are, are the core, the part. By constantly serving the lotus feet of great devotees, one's heart becomes purified. One's associated with the material existence is totally uprooted. And one obtains the treasure of loving service to Sri Hari. The particles of dust from the lotus feet of great devotees are the cause for receiving devotional service to Sri Hari. Those dust particles are like fire for destroying sinful reactions and the bridge for crossing the material ocean. That's a nice one, huh? Bhakti Vinod Thakur in his Sri Hari Bhakti Kalpalatika. The particles of dust from the lotus feet of great devotees are the cause for receiving devotional service to Sri Hari. I mean, their instructions, their every way, their association. Those dust particles are like fire for destroying sinful reactions and are the bridge for crossing the material ocean. <laughs> instructions which they give. And we read something about Pada Savings in the seventh canto of Bhagavatam, the Lord Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada gives famous verses in that like a lot. How he talks about the ninefold process of devotional service. So Padasevna, service to the lotus feet. According to one's taste and strength, hearing, chanting and remembrance may be followed by Padasevna. One obtains the perfection of remembering when one constantly thinks of the lotus feet of the Lord. Being intensely attached to thinking of the Lord's lotus feet is called Padasevna. When one is particularly adherent to the process of Padasevam, this process gradually includes other processes, such as seeing the form of the Lord, touching the form of the Lord, circumambulating the form of the Lord um, in the temple, visiting such places as Jagannath Puri, Dwarka, and Mathura to see the Lord's form, and bathing in the Ganges or Yamuna. Bathing in the Ganges and serving a pure Vaishnava are also known as Tadiyupasanam. This, this is also Padasevanam. The word Tadiya means in relationship with the Lord. Service to the Vaishnav, Tulsi, Ganges, and Jamuna are included in Padasevana. All these processes of Padasevana help one advance in spiritual life very quickly. The fourth of nine processes of Bhakti Yoga is Padasevana. Serving the feet of Krishna. Why feet? To approach a person's feet is a sign of humility. Even today in India, children learn to touch their parents' feet as a token of respect. This is not for the purple, this is another commentary on it. But the feet of the Supreme Lord are so sweetly beautiful, they are known as lotus feet. Simply thinking of them brings devotees to deep feelings of love and longing. The mighty Lord, the mo mighty devas or demigods, controllers of the sun, wind, and water, etc., and all aspects of this world, were delighted when Lord Krishna wandered the forests of Vrindavan, leaving his footprints in the dust. And Krishna's dear friends and gopis would press this dust against their heads and hearts, lost in ecstatic trance. The Vedic scriptures describe the Lord's feet in detail, on his soft reddish soles are the marks of the lotus, conch, shell, club, disc, flag, thunderbolt, fish and rod for controlling elephants. To worship 
Someone's feat is to accept the humblest of approaches, and yet the Lord makes this attractive with his exquisitely beautiful feet. Worship of the Lord's lotus feet is a great spiritual blessing. We don't normally consider the feet as the most beautiful part of the body. It may be somewhat well shaped, but they're not usually considered the most beautiful part of the body. Sometimes quite ugly. But it's the sign of humility. We even take shelter of the lowest part of the body. Maybe the ugliest part of the body in some way. Sometimes, not always. But it's a sign of humility, of respect. We take shelter of the lowest. And work up to the highest. We don't jump over, place ourselves in a lowly position. That's how we receive Krishna's mercy. Um, worship of the Lord's lotus feet is a great spiritual blessing because anyone charmed by those transcendental feet loses attraction to the temporary pleasures of this world. Rupa Goswami, a disciple of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, offers the example of Lakshmi Devi, the goddess of fortune, of one who has become perfect in Parasevam. It's, uh, she teaches, by example, she's all eternally perfect, she's the consort of the Lord, but it's an example because she's always there worshipping the Lord's lotus feet. Sri Lakshmi always massages the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord. This is remarkable. As noted in Srimad Bhagavatam, 111.33 The goddess of fortune, although by nature very restless and moving, could not quit the Lord's lotus feet. So Padasevna offers a tremendous spiritual lesson. It means approaching the Lord from the most humble position as supplicants at his feet, understanding that even the goddess of fortune comes to him in that way. Lakshmi's service need cause no resentment or pride for any of us because she is more than just a role model for good wives. She performs a task, a task most treasured by all realized souls, the gentle massaging of the Lord's lotus feet. A famous verse here from Bhagavatam. The devotees who are always engaged in the service of the toes of the lotus feet of the Lord can very easily overcome hard-knotted desires for fruitive activities. Because this is very difficult, the non-devotees, the jnanis and yogis, although trying to stop the waves of sense gratification, cannot do so. Therefore, you are advised to engage in the devotional service of Krishna, the son of Vasudeva. Jai, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. So we can see a few references there to the glories of meditating or serving the lotus seed of the Lord includes many other aspects we, we sometimes wonder what, what does that mean lotus seed of the Lord serving but here we see the manifestation not only does it mean to serve the pure devotees of the Lord but it includes worshipping Tulsi circumambulating bowing down so many things are inclusive within worshipping the lotus seed of the Lord any questions? Yes, Krishna. Thank you very much for your class, Maharaj. Maharaj, wherever Mahaprabhu is, that's the Dhamma. So Mahaprabhu is here, right in front of me. Is it necessary to waste my time and money to go all the way to India, which has become the chief exporter of beef? It's not necessary. It may be necessary when we're in, the, in let's say, certain certain reasons, uh, certain stages. One goes to the places um, of where Krishna's pastimes take place. It can reignite or, or help us to deepen. And of course, the association there is usually quite powerful. Um, and and it's that for a realized soul, one who is feel strongly like that, there's no need. But for those of us, mainly, who are still, you could say, not so attracted, then when we go to the holy places, um, it has a more, usually a more 
effective awakening of attraction towards the Lord and his pastimes, etc., etc. But in reality it's not necessary. If, if one can feel that same spirit of presence of the Lord wherever we are, we don't need to go anywhere whatsoever. It's not necessary. No Chaitanya told the Brahmin, Guru Brahmin, stay where you are. It's not necessary to go anywhere. Everything's here um, where you are now. Just um, Yala Dekatala Kala Krishna Vedashas. Follow this principle of hearing from the pure devotees, the scripture, etc. Um, and stay where you are. You don't need to go anywhere. Krishna is everywhere, no matter where we are. So we may not be able to see Krishna everywhere. Otherwise, if we do, then certainly there's no need to go anywhere whatsoever. The devotee only goes to preach. Um, pure devotees of the Lord. They go to the Holy Land, Holy Dance, because two reasons. One reason many pilgrims come depositing their sinful reactions. So the pure devotees go there to relieve the, the Holy Dharma, the sinful reactions. And secondly, they go there to um, give uh, the proper understanding of the purpose of going there. So they're going there to preach. It, it just reminded me of something very interesting, actually. I remember reading a long, 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 long time ago about Francis de Sisi. Uh, one of his followers said, um, should we, when we go, wherever we go uh, to preach, should we walk? And he said, and Francis de Sisi said, if your walking is not preaching, you shouldn't go anywhere. In other words, you don't walk somewhere to preach. You should be preaching all the time. Your walking should also be preaching. Your life is like that. So, uh, you know, the pure devotees of the Lord, whatever they do is Vindavan. You know, wherever they go. Um, whatever they do, whatever they think, every move is Krishna conscious. The spiritual world. But for those who are still materially affected, and um, are still materially conditioned. Particularly, it can have a beneficial effect. It's a recommended path, process of devotional service to visit the Holy Dharm, although it's not absolutely required. Because the Holy Land, as you say quite clearly, Nitai Guranga Raya here, Lord Chaitanya is here, the spiritual world's here, Radha Krishna Kanaya here, Jagannath is here. They're all here. You look at the altar today, what will you think of? You'll probably remember Jagannath Puri because the backdrop is, it reminds me of Jagannath Puri anyway. So I don't know about everybody else, but it reminds me. Um, so yeah, everything is here. The books are here. Prasadam is here. Devotees are here. Lord Nishringa David, everyone's here. Prabhupada's here. So it's not absolutely necessary if you say spending time and money, but the point of time and money is to awaken or to enhance our devotional service. So, for most of us visiting the holy dams, the original dams in their form that we can, let's say, access, and they're associated with devotees, has a, a very powerful effect also on our consciousness, purifying our consciousness, and bringing us, and freeing us from the material world, and bringing us closer to Krishna. So, it depends individually the situation of the devotee, what their realization is, uh, what their service is, and so on and so forth. Maybe they're having some difficulty in that. Going to the Dham often rekindles the devotee's enthusiasm to practice devotional service. They become very purified. Uh, everywhere you go, there's a temple, there's a, a river, a pure river, whatever it is. Anything else? Okay, Grantarashima Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Today is Ekadas.